have this train with the same color uh, as the payload in the, in, the, in the train and the mountain with the same color. It is, to me, it's a metaphor. It speaks to the fact that we're using this technology, we're using this rail and these trains to bring the resources back to the east to be converted into cars and to the trees to be converted into warehouses that we still have here today in Toronto and things to be shipped off to Europe as well. So to me it was this idea of the band of metal and what does it mean to the landscape and how do we begin to consider what this band of metal has done to transform that landscape. And then I went to mines, so I started looking at the biggest mines that and that's the one thing that I continually did in my research. Because how do you go from an idea, the mines or quarries or whatever, to the actual specific thing that you want to do? Well, the process was daunting because if I say mines, there are tens of thousands of mines. So how do I narrow it down? So I looked at all the mineral groups and then I researched where are the biggest mines on, on, on the planet doing that activity, copper, iron ore, um, you know, silver, whatever they were, I would then research. And then I'd go to the, the biggest mine and then knock on their door and say, hi, can I photograph your mine? And largely, at first they always be a little reluctant, but I say, look, you're the, I'm, the reason I'm sitting in front of you, Mr. CEO, is that you, know, you run the largest mine on the planet. I happen to photograph large things well. Uh, so you know, convince them to let me go in and, and, and take these photographs. And, and by and large, they always let me in. They were curious to see what I would come back with. They were very intrigued by the, my process and my thinking in terms of looking at this, these systems within the landscape and this transformation of the landscape. This here is the Bingham Valley copper mine. It's uh, the largest copper mine in the world. Well, next to this one, and this is the other one, which is uh, Chupicamaro in, in northern, uh, northern Chile. Uh, this at one point was said to produce, provide for close to 30% of the world's copper uh, from this one mine. There are 25,000 men at work here taking out this copper. So I started to think, you know, this mine in northern Chile that most people never get to the Atacama Desert, but I'm sure almost everybody in this room on a daily basis uh, partakes of, the, of what comes out of this mine in, in a phone, in your car, with copper windings, and a motor or something. If it's, if it's providing 30% of the world's copper at one point, we're all touching it in our telecommunication system somewhere. We are, we are uh, uh, using it. So these landscapes to me became something that we all are common to, something that we all partake of. No one's really uh, being left out of this equation. But the other thing that I kept thinking about is that I kept thinking about the past during Turner and when he thought about the sublime, he was thinking about nature being the omnipresent force and photographing the gale force, you know, storm at sea, you know, taking down a ship. And, and destroying the ship, and that, that nature was the omnipresent, fearful force that was then called the sublime. Fast forward 250 years to the Industrial Revolution, and I believe now there's a complete inversion that the sublime is the human species, that we're the force that's changing the planet. We are the omnipresent, fearful force that has the potential to reshape and change everything that we know about the planet. I also then began to think later on with mining. These are some, a couple of images from the more recent work I did on mining. This is in 2006 and 7, which I began to work with a helicopter and look at the landscape from an aerial perspective, where you start to see the landscape almost like looking at the insides of intestines or, or an organism. And again, I was kind of curious about the fact that here's a, a system that I've been photographing from the vantage points I can get from the ground. And then I went to the air. And this, you'll know, see, comes back later when I show you the work I did on water. Much of it was aerial. But with any mine comes tailings. So, you know, all mines, you can't get the material out. If we look at nickel, I think the best of uh, uh, one to five pounds of nickel comes out per ton. And you get a little bit of copper as well. But with that amount of metal, then you have 2,000 pounds of, of, of leftover silt or ground up stone. It has to go somewhere. So these are tailings ponds in, in, uh, inside the river. Uh, at this point, they're, they're covering that island. And you can walk into that island you see in the background. One can walk amongst the treetops. It's slowly filling up. And at the, the time when I was walking on these, we, there were already 70 meters of tailings and uh, covering 6,000 acres. So that was over 100 years of, of mining for, for nickel creating this huge mountain of tailings. So you probably see, you, you see them when you go along uh, uh, 
Highway 1 going along out of Sudbury, heading west. On the right, you see this big, big embankment. That's, this picture is taken on top of that embankment on the tailings. I then thought about quarries as well. I had done the mines and I thought, again, I, yeah, if you look back and think of the earlier images, I'm interested in that surface. I'm interested in, in, in different movements in art as much as I am in the environment. So I'm trying to bridge these two ideas. One, the, the notion of the fact that as an artist, I can work with a camera almost as a painter works with a canvas. I see those blank sheets of film as a painter would see a blank uh, canvas, and I fill it, and I spend a lot of time thinking about what am I going to put on there. So I started thinking about quarries, that the difference between a regular stone quarry or mines is they organically go for the ore body, and so you've got benches and slopes. Here, they're going for the dimensional stone to use the block to cut it up. And in this case, the Rock of Ages quarry in, in Vermont, most of the stone, 90%, was being used for memorials for grave sites. So they're spread across the country as, uh, with inscriptions on them. Um, and so this is one of some of the hardest granite, and it's been going for almost 160 years of quarrying. So they created these incredible architectonic spaces, and even the ones that were abandoned had a very fascinating structure to them that wasn't possible in the regular kind of mining. So again, here's an idea that starts as an idea, and then it starts to move to where do I find these places? How do I research this? And I found myself in eight different countries. This is in Portugal. We did a whole series in Portugal, um, and, and then went to Spain as well. So there were these fascinating quarries in Spain. But the idea also was that these quarries, because we're removing the stone a block at a time, that, that I was looking for the yin to the yang of a skyscraper in the city, that I think, felt that there had to be a place somewhere in nature that, that was as, as kind of you know, interesting to look at at scale as standing in front of the IMP building at CIBC or the big tower, and you look at it and you're dwarfed by it. And I'm thinking, where's the inversion of that same idea? And when I took this picture, I recognized that I finally, after 17 years of exploring quarries, I took this picture and I said, that's, that's it, I don't have to do any more pictures of quarries. This finally responded to the idea of the inverted skyscraper going in deep into the earth. Uh, so I was thinking a lot of times with, about the industrial, the industrial Revolution, I'm thinking like, look at the scale we're working on in these mines, you know, where can I take it next? So I thought, well, the Industrial Revolution has squarely moved from the West to China. That was a camera, ouch. Uh, <laughs> it was a camera. Um, so I started thinking about the Three Gorges Dam in China. That was my first idea. And I ended up going there to photograph and getting permission from the Chinese government. So at this point, after 20 years of negotiating into the mines, negotiating to get into a country was also a really interesting process. But uh, myself and my producer in China were convincing, and they gave us access onto the largest um, uh, dam ever to be constructed. Um, this is a, about a, a kilometer and a half long. It's the Three Gorges Dam. It's been complete for about I guess, six, seven years now. And, um, and it produces about, I think it's 20, uh, 26,000 megawatts of power. So that would be Ontario's con total consumption coming off of one, on peak consumption coming off of one dam. So each one of those turbines, which there were I think 34 of them, is a seven, uh, 700 megawatt turbine. Uh, at that time, they were considered the biggest turbines at the time. Uh, the latest one I photographed in China had an 820 megawatt turbine which is almost a nuclear power station per turbine. I also wanted to go see the factories. We, I kept hearing these stories that China uh, is the factory of the world, and all the manufacturing is going on there, going on out there, and, and a lot of these jobs have left, our, you know, particularly in Ontario, the manufacturing base, and they've left to go to China. Well, what do those factories look like in China? So I went to some of the largest factories I could find. This is a large, factory uh, Nupa, and it makes irons and coffee makers. So they made uh, I think 22 million irons per year and 3.5 million coffee makers per year, and also the George Foreman Grill, um, so, uh, which was one of their biggest clients. So this is inside the factory, and some of you may have seen the movie uh, Manufactured Landscapes, but if you've seen the movie, the, the movie takes a dolly shot along the whole right-hand side of this factory, looking down the aisles of this factory. So um, people often would say, "Oh, this isn't real. You couldn't see a factory. Couldn't be a factory this big." 
But after about eight minutes, you're seeing one quarter after another with workers putting these uh, coffee makers together, you recognize the scale of manufacturing that, that has occurred in China. And I think after that fell, manufactured landscapes. I think the difference, but people told me the big difference it made for them after seeing that film is they can never see made in China in the same way because we often heard about China as the manufacturing and we see you know, that little label on all the products we buy, but, but there were no visuals, there was no story, that visual story that was being told. So we were able to bring that story through film and through photography to the West and, and for the first time open people's eyes to the scale of, uh, of, of uh, manufacturing. And this is a chicken packing plant in China that did uh, 100 million chickens per year. Seems like a lot, but that would be equivalent to um, one, one meal for uh, a third of the population of China for uh, one lunch. So given four, four people per chicken, 100 million, that's, it's not a lot in the it comes to. In fact, I asked a question at the time, how many ducks and chickens, how many fowl are alive at any given time in China on any given day, and the number was six billion. So I did China, and then after doing China, I, I right through all of this, I was doing uh, this project on oil because I was actually heading to do the tailings work in '96, and I had this, you know, I think I left. Uh, I was going up north on the on the, on the um, uh, I guess it was like 400, and I pulled in. And I was pulling up with a fresh, fresh top rope. You guys know the road. Fresh road, drove out of the road, it's all like fresh blacktop. I just filled up my car with gas and I'm looking at everything and I have kind of a polyester jacket and I'm looking at everything and I'm going, God, everything's touched by oil. There's nothing we can do without oil. And I said, but I don't understand where our oil comes from just the same way I can understand where our iron came from, where copper came from. I didn't know what those landscapes looked like. So I set out to do a series on the uh, oil fields, original oil fields where oil began. And I went to the oil sands in Canada, and I went to a whole variety of different places. This is a, um, a Cold Lake project. Uh, uh, I think it's Exxon is doing a deep drilling of 800, drilling about 800 feet, and it's called the static heat process. So this is how a lot of the oil can be extracted from the oil sands. So they're injecting hot steam for about three months, and then it, all the separation of the oil from the sand occurs underground, and then they're able to pump it up. So they pump for several months, it gets too cool, it becomes too viscous, they heat it up again, and, and, and that's the process they do for extracting a lot of the oil uh, that's too deep to be able to scrape the top off. The oil that is accessible, this image really points it out. Uh, so you've got 20, so the whole forest is scraped back, and then you have about 20 feet of Dirt, and then just below that is that ancient seabed. And this is, um, so oil comes from the ocean, so this is ancient sea life that's been kind of interspersed amongst the sand, amongst the uh, um, you know, slow process of, uh, of a seabed forming an erosion and, uh, and the sand occurring and mixing up. So 12% of this is actually bitumen, which can be then converted into oil. So, so this is a very kind of early stage of oil. And what's one of the greatest creators of waste is the actual oil industry and the car and all of the things that are produced with, by the car and by jets because these have, things have an end of life. So this is the end of life of uh, uh, jet transports for, uh, for American military uh, outside of Tucson, Arizona. And they keep a lot of the jets there. There are over, I think, 4,500 jets there because of the low dew point and the fact that Ocean's at its lowest, it's so dry there. Here they're recycling jet engines, very high quality steels and aluminum and stainless steels in them. And even they're recycling oil drums. So these are 40 gallon drums. And the process is called densification. So they take these drums, crush them, squeeze all the air out of it so there's a certain grade of steel in the drum. And then the metallurgist, this is outside of Hamilton, calls for I need so many tons. Each block is two tons. I need so many tons of this metal because I, he's creating uh, a particular uh, grade of steel for an order. And then he goes to the scrapyards and starts to call all of the, and it's been sorted and, and bundled into these kind of cubes and calls for these cubes and gets them and drops them into the molten steel and measures it again and says, okay, I need a bit more of this bit. So it's a metal just calling on this stuff. Tires, this is the largest tire dump 
uh, ever assembled. I think at its peak it was 40 million tires. So it created its own landscape. Um, interestingly, they were, at the time, uh, the EPA uh, in California uh, was so afraid that this would catch fire that they set up a, a power plant, I think it was like a thousand, a thousand megawatt power plant, burning tires. They burned tires for 24 hours a day. And they reduced the pile down to about 25 million from 40 million. And three months after I took this photograph, it was hit by lightning and caught fire, and it burned for two years. So uh, with flames that were, I think, 2,500 feet high. So it was, uh, you know, imagine a 25 million tire fire. Wow, it was, it was crazy. And then I also went to where do oil tankers go to die? Oil tankers are the biggest things that we as humans have ever created um, as a vessel. And then I heard after the Exxon Valdez oil spill that we in Canada know very well, um, that the insurance companies were talking about not reinsuring single hull ships anymore uh, because if that, they can't deal with human error, but if that was a double hull oil tanker, the spill wouldn't have occurred. It would have been contained. So they were going to reinsure single hull ships, and then one of the insurance guys said, yeah, there's going to be a, a, a glut of single hull oil tankers hitting the scrap market to be decommissioned and cut up. Uh, in, in the next decade, and then about four or five years after I heard that, I went to Bangladesh and uh, found where these tankers were being uh, taken apart. And you can see a bit of that as well in the film Manufactured Landscapes. That, that, um, but these are just big ships. It's a very, kind of a very surreal Mad Max environment. And they're just cutting things up. The most sophisticated tool they have is a cutting torch. They're just cutting these ships up with a cutting torch. Uh, often barefoot, no cutting glasses. It was quite something. So here's your look. You're looking at the inside wall of an oil tank that's been pulled up onto shore and being cut up. Uh, this is the event. This is the first place. Uh, Baku, Azerbaijan. This is the first place where they created a um, the first offshore drilling rig because they, they knew there was oil there, because there was always this oil slick out there in the water, and they were drilling on the land, and they said, we can only get out there and drill, we can get that oil too. And it was in 1934, a Polish engineer figured out, this was the very beginning of offshore drilling, figured out how to get a rig out there. It's a Caspian Sea, so that's the, those stilts are basically the, the things that they would drop down, anchor onto the ground, and then put the rig on top of them, so those were the legs of the drilling rigs. This is also in Baku, almost a decade into doing the oil project. I had never seen oil. It's like one of those things. It's like blood. If you see on the ground, it's not good. Uh, oil is not, you know, you never see it. It's always a life system, but it's in pipes. It's like our veins. But here in Baku, um, there was still oil that was left in these ponds. So you're, that reflection, that mirror reflection, is actually looking at oil. Water was even more even. Yeah, it's everything, all life. If you see any life form whatsoever, you are in the presence of water. So, you know, life equals water. And I thought, well, how do I begin to tackle something on that scale? And uh, it took a while. And, and I, I, I was working in Australia at the time in 2007, and I did those earlier aerials um, in Australia. And I was thinking, okay, and while I was doing that work, I was reading all these reports, and I was meeting a lot of uh, photographers who were doing the beat all across Australia. And uh, the stories that I was hearing about the drought were insane. And they were just like, oh my god, this is really uh, consequential. These are uh, amazingly difficult stories. And one story that, that just kind of floored me was uh, the reporter had gone into an Adelaide at the time. It was a, 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 a level five emergency, which is the top level of drought. And he ordered a beer and a glass of wine at the bar. And he was sitting there. He finished off his beer and he drank half of his glass of water. And he was about to leave and pay. And he was about to leave and said, Where are you going? He said, Well, I'm leaving. I paid you. He said, No, no, you haven't finished your water. And he made him finish his water right then and there. And to me, it was like, we're so inundated with water. We have, we're at you know, probably the highest concentration of fresh water known to, to the planet. The Great Lakes indeed has that that um, reputation of about 20% of the world's water, and then we have 2 million lakes north of us that contain about another 10%. So Canada is clearly connected to or uh, 
custodians of almost 30% of, of the world's known fresh water. So to me, that was also another reason that, that you know, we as the kind of custodians of all this water, we, we should see ourselves as an as a important water nation and to understand water and not to take it for granted. Because I think at some point, we're going to become a very de desirable destination based on the fact that we are in possession of so much fresh water. So I wanted to begin, so I started thinking, I worked with the National Geographic, they called me and said, would you be uh, interested in doing a project in California on water? This is back in 2008, I got the call. So I said, yeah, I'm interested. I, I, I'm already wanting to go there. I, I, I've been to Australia, I was talking about water to a lot of the reporters there. Yeah, I'm in. So we spent a year doing research with, with the uh, National Geographic, which I must say was an amazing team to work with. And, um, and from there, uh, I, I began to use that as my base. And I, I started to look at water different ways. One is, uh, the first and one interesting way to look at it was distressed landscapes, where we've got it wrong. Something's gone wrong. So this was where uh, the oil, BP oil spill occurred. And I'm looking at this land, uh, and at this reports, and don't usually, I don't usually pursue disasters. Uh, I, I didn't go to the Katrina. I'm, I'm, all, my, all my photography to that point was largely intentional landscapes. These are not accidents. These are, these are, these are designed landscapes to provide us with certain things that we need to live our lives. There's no, they may end up as a disaster, but this is an intentional landscape. This is not a, 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 a natural disaster or something we didn't intend. Um, but here's something that wasn't intended, but again, to me, it was something that told, again, it's a Frankenstein story repeating itself in Mary Shelley's story, where we create something in the lab, we're able to do something, we create a life, and then it gets out of control, it gets out of the lab, and now it has to be you know, contained, how do we contain it? To me, this is really the same story, not fully understanding risk, drilling it for the first time at 23,000 feet, losing control of the, of, of the well, and now all of a sudden we've got this thing spilling out 60,000 uh, barrels a day for almost three months. So this is the oil slip that's surrounded, and the, and the discovery, which is the um, drilling rig, the double-headed drilling rig, so this is now the fastest drilling rig, and then the, the one that drilled the original condom hole is now drilling the relief well, trying to, to, to again, plug up the, the, the well. So this was, uh, to me, a, a, an interesting metaphor as well. And they've been bringing the oil and the water project together in a kind of an unholy um, coming together. Then I went to Owens Lake, where uh, Mulholland, uh, in, back in 19, the, the, the beginning of the century, 1900s, um, Los Angeles was running out of water, and it couldn't grow any further, and uh, they needed water, so he said, I can get you water, I can get you the Owens River water, and, and he quiet, on a quiet went and bought up all the land necessary to build an aqueduct, I think 350 miles, into Los Angeles, um, and uh, called the California Aqueduct, the Los Angeles Aqueduct, and diverted all the water, and uh, dried up Owens Lake, which became a huge uh, dry bed that created massive dust storms. And then this road here is actual, actual uh, road work and irrigation systems being funded by uh, Los Angeles. They had to do over a billion dollars of reparations to wet with sprinklers, wet that whole bed, so it wouldn't create dust storms. So this is what you're, that's what you're, you're seeing, is that kind of uh, remediation. This is another large body of water, the Salton Sea, and it's now become so salinated from the Colorado River and the Imperial Valley farming, and it's picking up salt as the farming is happening, and it's concentrating in the Salton Sea, which has become uninhabitable to most, uh, I think tilapia is the only last surviving fish uh, that can deal with that kind of salinity. Uh, it's a larger user of water than what we eat as calories from food from, from the rains. And you can see this imagery tells the story of the terraforming. So, you know, what they're working with is the desert on the right, and add water, and you have one of the richest growing, growing places in, in all of California. If you've been following the news, this is Phoenix, if you've been following the news, 
uh, California is now experiencing one of its worst droughts ever uh, in recorded history. So, and the Colorado is at its low point. So it is quite something, it's something that's really beginning to show problems. This is a Shasta, uh, Shasta Lake, which is a reservoir up in the northern California. And this is at its lowest point. I've, I've just checked into it recently. It's now lower than this. And this is near the intake valves of the dam. So they're, they're um, very close. Again, in the controlling of water, Holland, 50% of Holland, I mentioned it earlier, was with a claim from the seabed. This is all the reclamation work. It's Rotterdam in the background. Uh, but this is all built up uh, uh, human uh, uh, um, systems to hold back the seawater. Uh, uh, London Municipal Sewage Processing Plant. 